his natural face in a mirror. 24, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately forgets what kind of person he is. So James is talking and he goes down in verse 25. He says, he says but not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. And so I want to, you know, we, we're now, this is, we're now, uh, have done four sessions in the indwelling life class. And my question to you is, how much of what you have heard have you put into practice? Yeah, crickets. No, I'm kidding. I'm only kidding with you. I do want to challenge you, though. How much have what you heard, have you changed the way you think? How much of what you have heard have you changed your meditation, your prayer life? How much have you allowed the Lord to rewire you on the inside, or have you already forgotten what we've already talked about? See, that's, the, that's what can happen when we don't put into practice what we've heard. We forget. Okay, you might remember that chart, or you might remember this point or that point, but if you don't get it into your prayer life, if you don't get it into your meditation, if you don't get into to changing the way you think, and you don't put it into practice, you will forget. You will forget. Especially if you're, if you're 40 or younger, I want to challenge you. Okay, these things are life changing, not because of me, because it's the word of God. If I would have known this stuff so much, you know, like a lot of us are going, if only I would have learned this younger. This is life changing. This is life transforming. I want to encourage you to dig into this. Dig into this. You still there? You still love me? Amen. I just want to challenge you. What steps in your practical prayer life have you made to make the spirit-led life a habit and a discipline you practice every single day? Because if we don't put into practice what we're learning, I, I promise you this, I promise you this, you will forget this entire lesson. You'll forget it. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the life of others. I've heard the testimony. In fact, we heard one testimony of a lady. She said, I heard this stuff 40 years ago, but because I didn't get it into my prayer life, because I didn't get it into my practice, because I didn't implement it into and change the way I lived, she said, I forgot it, and now I'm hearing the same thing over and over again. And it's just like, God, grip us that we would put this into practice. And there's always, at the end of all the notes, there's applications you can do and things you can do to implement these into your lives. But I just want to encourage you, don't be a forgetful hearer of the word. Be an effectual doer. Amen? Amen. So now this is getting into more of the message. Let's turn to Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. And Paul... What I'm, what I'm going to share with you right now is, is kind of the, the overview of, of this entire class of how you can implement this into your life. And, and what I'm going to share with you is, is so important, so vital. Um, it's the air you breathe in the spirit-led life. And Paul is, is writing and he says, and I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective, may become, what it means is energized, energized, the energy of God. You know the way you feel after you drink a latte, that energized faith, the way Shelly feels the moment she wakes up because she has natural energy. I don't have that, but I got to drink a latte to make up for what Shelly has. But that's basically what it's saying, this energized faith that, 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 your, that the fellowship of your faith may become effective, may become operative, may become energized, may become active, activating your faith through the knowledge, and that word knowledge is the precise and the correct knowledge that comes by relational experience. That's what it means in the Greek. The precise and the correct knowledge that comes from relational experience that your faith may be energized, may become active by the precise and the correct knowledge that comes by relational experience of every good thing, what? That is in you. 
What Paul is saying here, what Paul is saying here is to think upon what and who is inside of you. Think upon the treasure of Christ who is in you. Think upon the one who is in you and how he has transformed your spirit and how all that Jesus has done in the finished work of the cross, when he said it is finished on the cross and it is finished in your human spirit, think about that, meditate upon it, ponder it. Because when you do, what happens is your faith becomes active. Your faith becomes operative. Your faith becomes energized. And when your faith is operative and energized, it allows the Spirit of the Lord to make it real in your experience. All that we're talking about is meant to become meditation to you, is meant to become what you meditate on in prayer and think about in prayer, that your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. They are joined together as one. You cannot be separated from the very Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. The very one who raised Jesus from the dead and who created the universe is one spirit with you, grafted to your spirit, inseparable from your spirit. That is awesome. You have a treasure inside of you. You have great wealth inside of you. Think about all that God has done, that you have the glory of God in you. You have a river of living water in you. You have the anointing, the truth, the helper, the kingdom of God. All of that is inside of you. Think about that. Ponder it. Realize all that Jesus has done. It's such good news. Listen, if you're really hearing the gospel, which means good news, if you're really hearing it, you should ask, actually feel like, is this really true? Because it sounds so incredible. It sounds so incredible to be true that I wonder if the preacher's really exaggerating. Then you're hearing the gospel because it is unbelievable. It is incredible what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. You are not far from God. You are connected to him spirit to spirit. You can abide in him because he lives in you. You have the holy of holies inside of you. You are the temple of God, and the spirit of God dwells inside of you if you're born again. That is awesome, awesome, awesome news. I want to show just a couple slides here just to walk through this with us. Is faith in God's facts allows the spirit to make it real in your experience. Okay, say it one more time. F okay, faith in God's facts allows the spirit to make it real in your experience. See, when Shelly gets up and brings testimony like that, her life is being transformed. When we heard the testimonies on our Zoom call uh, yesterday of, of lives being transformed by this teaching. What's going on, what's happening is faith is being awakened. Faith is being awakened. And, and so when I say God's facts, what I mean is this, is I want to make a distinction between God's facts and God's promises. God's promises are I'm believing God for a healing. I'm believing God for a financial breakthrough. I'm believing God for a relational breakthrough. I'm believing God for a new job. I'm believing God for a new house. I'm believing God for a family or a husband or a wife or whatever it is. That's a promise. That's a promise. We're believing God to do something for us. But God's facts are actually what has already been accomplished. God's facts are real no matter if you feel them or not. God's facts are what Jesus finished for you on the cross and what the Holy Spirit finished for you in your human spirit. When you come into agreement with the truth of God's word, of what God's facts are, and faith rises up, then what happens is it allows the Holy Spirit to begin to make true and active those very things that are already true about you, that are already true in you. When Jesus was crucified, you were crucified with him. When Jesus was resurrected, you were raised up with him. When Jesus ascended, you were ascended with him. When Jesus was seated at the right hand of God, you've been seated with him. 
When you were born again, your spirit was raised from the dead. Your spirit is now righteous, holy, Christ-like, and complete. You are now a partaker of the divine nature. You have the glory of God and the kingdom of God and the truth of God inside of you because Christ is in you. Your spirit is one spirit with the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. When you begin to hear this, faith begins to awaken. Do you, so do you feel different from already from me saying this? See, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You can actually activate this yourself. You don't need me. You can speak it this out loud. You can write it down in a notebook. You can, you got to voice it though, because what happens is faith is energized as you come into agreement with God's facts of what has been accomplished. It is finished. Jesus finished it for you on the cross, and the Spirit of God has finished his work in your spirit. Now he's still doing work in your heart and work in your soul and work in your body. The next slide is faith comes by renewing the mind by meditation. Paul wrote about the law of the mind and the law of faith. These are laws. They cannot be violated. They're like the law of gravity. You throw a ball up, the ball comes down. You want to you overcome the law of gravity? It's the, it's the law of aerodynamics to fly a plane 500 miles per hour in the air. But if the engine cuts off, that plane, because of the law of gravity, is going to take over and bring the plane down. These, this is a, the, there is a law of faith to the Spirit-led life. When you don't know about what Jesus Christ has done, and when you don't know of the Spirit of God inside of you and what He has done and who He is... When you don't know that, or if you don't believe it, then that unbelief and that doubt suppresses the Spirit of God inside of you so that He can't work, so that you can't change, so He's not operative. But when you know and when you discover these things, what happens is your faith is energized, your faith is activated, and then when the, your faith is activated, it allows the Spirit to make it real into your heart and your soul and your body. You can experience the work of the cross in your soul when you believe that you've already been crucified with him. I have been crucified with him. Therefore, when I believe that fact that what has happened, the spirit of God who now dwells in me can apply the, the, by, the, by the power of Christ that cross to your soul so that you, your self-life, can be fully crucified. See, we have power inside of us. We have the very power that raised Jesus from the dead in you. We have the power that created the universe in you. You have that power in you. And when you believe it, when, you, when faith is awakened, when meditation comes, it awakens faith and energizes faith. God's facts are what, the next slide, God's facts are what Jesus finished for you on the cross and what the Spirit finished for you in your spirit. The next slide. Faith in God's facts is the key that allows the Spirit to make it real in your experience. For you to experience His life in your heart, in your soul, and in your body. By the way, I, I want to give credit to Watchman Nee for that because just I learned that from him, so I don't want you to think that it's original. I learned that from Watchman Nee, but it's the absolute, to me, if I could say, how, how okay, someone says, how do you actually implement the, the spirit-led life, the indwelling life, the abiding life into your everyday life? This is the oxygen of the spirit-led life. It's faith. Faith in what God has already done. Faith in what God has already, Jesus Christ has already accomplished. Faith in, in him that he even dwells inside of you. See, so many people are like looking for God out here. We got to go here. We got to go there. We got to go everywhere. And the Lord's like, no, if you're born again, you've got the spirit inside of you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so we're looking here. We're looking everywhere. And God's like, no, inside of you, there are rivers of living water. So let me ask you a question. Do you know what's wrong with you? Do you know what's wrong with you? Okay, if you don't, I could tell you. I'm just kidding. I have a feeling if every one of us know what's wrong with us, don't we? 
we know we have these struggles with this, we know we have these struggles with that, and, you know, you know, most, so many messages we hear about, okay, this is what's wrong with me, this is what's wrong with me, and a lot, a lot of you are like, yeah, you're part of the problem, Brian. Remember the message you preached a couple weeks ago about the five hindrances? You showed me everything that was wrong with me. What I've found, though, we need to know those things. We need to know those things. We're not, we're not to ignore our sins or our shortcomings, but what I've found, if I will focus on what's right about me because Christ is in me and he has transformed my spirit, that will propel me forward. See, when you always focus on what's wrong with you, it will paralyze you. But when you focus on what is right with you because Christ dwells inside of you, it'll propel you forward. So if you start meditating on and thinking about, okay, if you spend all your time going, okay, this is what's wrong with me, I'm, you know, I'm under condemnation, I've got, you know, whatever it is. Like you can name a million things. A battle with lust or a battle with anxiety or a battle with depression or I'm blowing my temper or my anger or whatever, a million different things it is. We all know we've got all these issues. We all know pretty much that we are a mess. If we have any self-awareness, we know, okay, we're a mess. If you focus on that, you're going to stay in it. It's going to paralyze you. Okay, this is not like self-help psychology, you know, by God it, I can do it, you know, I'm a good person, whatever, you look in the mirror, self-affirmation. It's not any of that. This is about, I'm talking about because of Christ in you. I'm talking about because the Spirit of the Lord is inside of you, meditating, thinking about, contemplating, because the Spirit is in me, because the Spirit is in me and I focus on Him and what's right about me. He's transformed my spirit. We're going to get into this for the next five sessions. We're going to spend about what is right about you if you're born again. Because, not because of you, but because of Christ. And when you focus on that, it'll move you forward and you will begin to make spiritual progress. It's life-changing. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord told the church of Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. I want to tell you, you are a spiritual billionaire. You have incredible wealth spiritually. The problem is, the problem is we don't know it. The problem is religion has lied to us. The problem is, is we're ignorant of the wealth that we have. And so what do we do? We live in poverty. We live so far beyond, below the, what God has made available to us because we don't know who dwells inside of us. It reminds me of this story. I, I've, I've read the story about Ira Yates. And Ira, I don't know if you've heard the story, but he was an orphan at the age of 12. And he started to earn manual, this is like in the 1920s, but he started to earn hard, you know, working by hard manual labor. 19, started raising cattle. Uh, in 1913, he traded like 200 heads of cattle for a dry goods store in Texas. But a few years later, he got tired of that and wanted to get back into, into cattle farming or whatever. So he, he made an exchange with a Texas landowner. And then what he realized, for about 11 years, he lived in, on, the, on the brink of bankruptcy, uh, trying to make ends meet, you know, trying to make all the ends meet. The mortgage was increasing, all this. And one day he said, I'm going to invite an oil company to come and see if there's any oil on my land. And to his amazement, there was like a, a, a gusher of oil on his land, and instantly he became a millionaire. And I think there's over like a billion barrels of oil that have been produced since about 1926 by Yates Oil Field. And so the point is, Ira Yates was a millionaire, but for 11 years, because of ignorance, he lived in poverty. Now, that describes the church of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? 
We have a treasure inside of us, but we're living in spiritual poverty. We're living so far be below what God has intended for us. We're living, we're living with constant battles of I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that the battles never go away, but we're, we're entangled by sin, shortcomings, anger, lust, depression, anxiety, uh, whatever it is, low self-esteem, low worth, whatever it is. It could be a million different things. We're, we're, in, we're living in spiritual poverty because we don't know who lives inside of us. Because we don't know what he, we don't know who he is, we don't know how he's transformed our spirit. And see, what I realize is that dead religion blinds you to the treasure in you. But revelation unearths the riches that are inside of you. That when you have revelation of Christ in you, not just from a message, but it's in your heart, not just by what I say or write, but it's in you, when that revelation opens up into you, you realize I've been a billionaire for all these years, but I've been living in spiritual poverty. So you don't have to live in spiritual poverty. And so for the next, for the next um, five sessions, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about who Christ is in you, his glory in you, He's guidance in you. He's power in you. We're going to talk about who you are as a new creation. Your new spirit has been regenerated, resurrected. Your new spirit is now righteous, complete, a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit has now been completed. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> like a train, the train of glory, I guess, you know? Who knows? But I want us to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. And what, as, as you're turning here, what I've found is that you can't hear this enough. You really can't. This, this message never gets old. Um, just hearing it over and over and over, it never gets old, to me at least. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the, the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. I want you to realize that you have a treasure inside of you. You have a treasure that's worth far more than billions of dollars because that treasure inside of you is Jesus Christ. He is the spirit, the, the spirit of Christ living in you is a treasure worth more than a billion dollars, worth more than $10 billion. It can't even be measured. Though you are an earthen vessel, though I'm an earthen vessel, that we have our weaknesses, our hangups, our shortcomings. The treasure in you is invaluable. It's invaluable. Now, the problem is we don't know it. And so I want to talk just a little bit today about the glory that's in you. And Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Do you not know that you are a temple of the living God? And the Spirit of God dwells inside of you? They didn't know that. The, the Corinthians were having external manifestations of the Spirit. The Corinthians were experiencing the external movings of God, the gifts of the Spirit. But they were looking for God out there, somewhere, rather than in here. They were pursuing the presence out here. we got to pursue His presence out here. Now, that's not wrong, but it's out of order if we're not looking for God here. And so Paul said, and, and this is a revolutionary thought. You got to understand to, you know, the Jew of the first century, the temple was everything. It's where God dwelled. It was the centerpiece of the entire nation. And Paul's saying, you are the temple. And the people that day had to just be like, what? <laughs> what are you saying, Paul? This is such a revolutionary idea. Paul's basically saying, you don't have to go here, there, and everywhere to meet with God. You can go right here. We've got so much of the church 
crying out, we need a revival, we need a revival, we need a revival, we need a revival. I'm all for any revival God wants to bring. But I believe we would have a lot less cries for revival if we learn just to live. The church just learned to live the spirit-led life and what God's already given us. There would be a lot less need for revival. You would live in revival. You don't need revival. You've got the reviver in you. We keep, and I, now listen, I believe there is going to be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong. I believe, I believe absolutely there is a coming and outpouring of the Holy Spirit unlike we've ever seen. But I just want to say, if we just lived with, the, if we just lived with what God has already given us and lived by his life and lived by that treasure we already have, we would be living in revival. We don't need, Paul's basically saying is, you don't need to search for God out there somewhere. I got to get his presence out here. I got to go to the glory meeting. I got to go where this prophet or apostle's uh, preaching. I got to go where the miracle service is or whatever. And again, I'm not saying that's wrong because God might lead you to go to some of those. But when we become addicted to having to go out there somewhere to try to find God, you see what I'm saying? Without first going right here in the holy of holies of his temple and meet with him at any moment, on any day, at any time. See, you don't need a man. Now, again, you understand what I'm saying. You don't need first to have to run to this teacher, that teacher, that prophet, this person, you know, all that. You have God right here. You have the potential for a holy of holies relationship with God because his glory dwells inside of you. Your spirit is like the Ark of the Covenant that contains the glory of God. That is a revolutionary idea. You know, we've heard that scripture so often. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit and the living God dwells in you. And we can quote it and memorize it and all that stuff. And yet, it's just, all it is, is knowledge. It's not revelation. But when you really understand, I have in me the Holy Spirit. I am the Holy of Holies, or the, my spirit is the Holy of Holies. That changes everything. You don't have to run here, there, and everywhere to experience revival. You've got the reviver in you so that you can experience revival every single day. That's incredible. See, your body is like the outer court, visible for all to see. Your soul is like the holy place, enlightened by the presence of God in your spirit. But down deep inside of you, where the invisible eye can't see, is where God himself dwells in this holy of holies. And you can meet with him in the holy of holies, Diving down deep through the soul into your spirit to meet and to commune with him and to have the most incredible relationship with God you, could, you can't even fathom. Oh, let's show the slide of that graphic of the different, the holy, this, the three circles, but the holy of holies one, yeah. So this, this graphic here, you know, we, you remember the, the first graphic of your spirit, your heart, your soul, your body. I kind of just put on there, your body is the outer court. Your soul, your heart are the holy place. And your spirit is the holy of holies. You have the holy of holies inside of you. You can go down deep. Angie had the analogy that the Lord's been speaking to her about this was like a treasure hunter. As you, as you dive down, there's treasure at the bottom of the ocean, and you di dive down deep through the ocean to the, reach the treasure that's down at the very bottom. And that's kind of what it is like with, with Christ. The treasure is here deep, deep down in your spirit. And it's like you're diving down deep past the way your body feels, past the way your emotions feel, past the way your analytical mind is reasoning, past the way your, your will and your desires are choosing, past the heart and its motives, 
You're going all the way down deep to the Holy of Holies, to this very place where God himself dwells. You have him in you. You have the potential for an ongoing Holy of Holies relationship with him. See, if you think about it, the Ark of the Covenant to ancient Israel, it was, it was everything. It was a place where God spoke. If, if, if ancient Israel wanted to hear from God, they, they would get the Ark of the Covenant and they would say, let's inquire of the Lord. It was the place of warfare where if they were going to go out into battle, they would send the Ark of the Covenant first into battle. And if you remember when, when David put the Ark of the Covenant in Obed-Edom's house, his entire house was blessed. When they put the Ark of the Covenant into the Philistine temple, the, the pagan god Dagon fell down and crashed. Do you realize your spirit is like the Ark of the Covenant? That you have God living inside of you? That means, like ancient Israel, you can hear from God at any moment. That means you can experience the blessing of the Lord. That means you can have victory over the devil and over anything you're encountering. That means you can live an overcoming life. You have that in you. You have him in you. The problem is we forget it. The problem is we just we forget what that means. Your spirit is God's holy of holies. The holy of holies is not out there somewhere. The holy of holies is in you. You can have a holy of holy relationship with the Lord right now. You don't have to wait and die to go to heaven to experience this. You can have this right now, which is incredible. The glory of God is inside of you. The Shekinah glory of God is inside of you. I don't mean in fullness, but that means wherever you go, you're carrying God. When you go to work, you're very different than those who work, you work with that are not born again. You are carrying literally God as a temple. When you go to the store, I need to remember this, especially at restaurants, that take, make a long time to wait. I handled it perfect, yeah. Not. I was hangry, so I did not handle it very good. But wherever you go, God help us remember this. <laughs> Makes a great message, but it's easy to forget. You carry God. Okay, help me remember. Help me remember. Yeah. Oh, I will. You carry God wherever you go. When you get together with family on Thanksgiving and the conversation turns ugly, hopefully that's not going to happen. I'm not prophesying that. You carry God. God help us remember. You carry God. You're a carrier of God. You're the temple of God. You're carrying him wherever you go. School, work, grocery store, whatever, walk, wherever you go. You are, you are literally the temple of God. Now, they don't know you are, but you know you are. You're carrying the presence of God. The glory of God is inside of you. Think about that. That's amazing. I'm not exaggerating. I promise you, this is scripture. You carry God wherever you go. You're a carrier of the glory of God. Not only is glory in you, but you have a river, a gushing, flowing river of life inside of you. The river of life we read about in Revelation chapter 21 that comes out of the throne. You have in seed form that river right here inside of you. See, the Jewish people in the days of Jesus, they knew, they were groomed from the very from the very young age, they, were, they knew, okay, the, the rabbis were teaching them one day that when the Messiah comes, rivers of living water are going to flow out of the temple. And they all had this messianic expectation that when the Messiah comes, rivers of living water are going to come out of the temple. 
And they were quoting Zechariah 14.8 and Ezekiel 47. But here Jesus says to them, John chapter 7, verse 38. Now, just think of the context. All the Jewish, the entire culture knew when the Messiah comes, rivers of living water are going to come out of the temple. And Jesus stands up. He had to stun the crowd. And he says, if you believe in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And the, and the crowd had to look at him. Now, Lord, do you mean the temple? Yes. So you mean that temple right over there, not that temple. There's a new temple coming. Oh, you mean when the Messiah comes at his second coming to set up the Davidic kingdom? I'm not talking about that temple. I'm talking about you if you believe in me. Yes, rivers of living water will one day come from the Jerusalem temple, but you are that temple. Rivers, gushing, flowing rivers of life are inside of you. And God wants you to learn, God wants me to learn how to unleash that deep well of salvation, of life-giving water to give to, to uh, drink to this world around us that is desperate, hopeless, searching for answers. You are the answer. I am the answer because Christ is in us. Just like Jesus gave the woman at the well drink from the well of salvation, from the well or from the, the well, and it was a symbol of the well of salvation, you can give anyone you come into contact with a drink from the river of living water that flows out of you. If you learn how to release that river from you, deep inside of you, outward. See, not only do you have the glory of God inside of you, you have rivers of living water. See, you are a well of salvation. You're a well of life-giving water. That is who you are. That's who God's made you to be, a well of life-giving water. This world is, de if you haven't figured it out, this world is desperate right now. Let's be the answer to what this world needs. They need life. They don't need religion. They need Christ. They don't need a bunch of do's and don'ts. Now, yet they do need morality, but they need Christ. You know what I'm, understand what I'm saying? Be the life to them. Be the life-giving water. Give them drink of that inward man of Christ in you. Give them drink of that life-giving spirit. Give them drink of that, of, that, of that spirit. See, Jesus said in John 4, 14, he says, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but this water will become in us who believe a well of water springing up to eternal life. Isaiah 12 said that you will learn how to draw joyously from the wells of salvation. You, your spirit is a well of salvation. Your spirit is the source of living water. And when you learn to draw up and to draw out that life, you can then release that life to those who desperately need Christ. See, you are the hands and feet of Jesus. You are the body of Christ on the earth. The world is desperate. Let's be that, that river of life, not by trying, but by living and abiding, by learning to release the life, the river of life. And see, even if you need a drink, not a drink of alcohol. I'm talking about a drink of the living spirit. You don't have to ask the latest revivalist, the latest evangelist, the latest prophet or apostle, lay hands on me so I can have a drink. Can I, I can have a drink. You can learn to draw from within your spirit yourself and drink deeply from him. 
You don't have to have people lay hands on you to experience that. I think in the charismatic church, we got so caught up in that a while back, and it's like the Lord's like, I mean, it's okay, you can get someone to do that, and I'll touch you that way, but you can, you can learn to do this yourself. You can go here and drink every day life-giving water. If you're thirsty, if you're thirsty for God, you can drink. You don't have to go somewhere. You can go here into the Holy of Holies. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. See, this is good news, isn't it? Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him, through Christ, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. What this is saying here is that we can have a holy of holies relationship. Because of the spirit of God who dwells within us, he's like an umbilical cord that connects us to God in heaven. He's like an umbilical cord that connects us to the Father and the Son in heaven. As we can experience a holy of holies relationship with the spirit and the spirit connecting us to the Father and the Son in heaven. See, because you are a temple of the living God, and because the glory of God is inside of you, and because rivers of living water are inside of you, you can have a holy of holies relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to live in the outer court of man-made uh, man religion. You don't have to live in the holy place, mixture, you can have the undiluted glory of God in your spirit and live in this holy of holies relationship with him. You can meet with him and commune with him day by day. See, all you have to do, instead of, look, instead of first looking out there somewhere, is you turn inward to your spirit where he dwells and you go deep down to the Holy of Holies where he is, and you commune with him and fellowship with him here. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation 2, 17. Jesus was talking to the church of Pergamos and he was encouraging them to overcome and he says that whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. Now the hidden manna, what that means is in the Ark of the Covenant, they put the manna into the Ark of the Covenant and then that Ark of the Covenant went into the Holy of Holies. So Jesus is saying, I will give some of this hidden manna. I will give some of this hidden, this, this hidden revelation, the hidden truth of God, the hid, the, those mysteries of God that have been sealed up, the deep things that are in God's heart that only come into the Holy of Holies, that I will give you access to the hidden manna. Now, ultimately, that's looking to the eternity. That's looking to a holy of holies relationship with God in the holy of holies in heaven and the fullness of glory. But what I've found is when you begin to overcome and you begin to live by the life of Christ and you begin to overcome the world and the flesh and the devil, you can actually experience this right now. You can experience the hidden manna things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, all that God has uh, pre prepared for those who loved him. That's not reserved for eternity to know that. Paul said, for God has revealed them to, uh, to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. You can know the mysteries of God right now before you die in a holy of holies relationship with Jesus Christ. I've tapped into this just a little bit. 
And I'm telling you, it's incredible. I'm only at the beginning of it. I'm walking, stumbling. But because of my spiritual spirit union with Jesus Christ here, the Spirit gives me access, spiritually speaking, to the Father and the Son in heaven, by which me and you can know the deep things that are in God's heart, what his burdens are, what his passions are, the mysteries that he's unveiling, the revelation that he's showing, his purpose, what he's doing, the times in which we live, what is on his heart. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you, you might feel insignificant. You might feel unworthy. No, you can have that. You can have that if you believe. If you believe. If you believe. If you get the doubt and the unbelief away to realize I can have the hidden manna in the holy of holies that is reserved for only those who come into the holy of holies. I can partake and feast of the person of Jesus Christ and his word and the mysteries of his word and the truth of his word. I can know all this. I can have this incredible deep relationship with him. You really, really can have this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about it. We have access to the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ here and here. To know the thoughts of God. Just like your spirit knows the thoughts of your mind, the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God and he communicates those thoughts to you spirit to spirit. You can dwell in communion with him. You can dwell in conversational intimacy with him. And, and, and uh, Isaiah says that if you're hungry, come to him and eat and drink and delight yourself in abundance. There's no limit to this. There is no limitation to this. You can go, listen, you're as close to God as you want to be. If you're not close to God, it's your own fault. It's not his. You can go as deep as you want to in him. There's no limitations. None. You can go so deep into God. Why would you not want to? Why would you want to stay in the shallows of what's called Christianity when you can go into the very depths of God? Experiencing the depths of Jesus Christ in this holy of holies relationship See, if you want the holy of holy relationship with him for all eternity, you're not going to have that unless you have it now on earth, in part. See, if you think, okay, well, no, I'll just wait to have it then, you won't have it then. You'll be in the outer court. Whatever you want and, in, and are pursuing in this life, you will have in the fullness in the next age. If you're pursuing that inward holy of holies relationship and you're partaking, if you go deep, God says, in the age to come, you will have this in fullness. In the holy of holies. Do you want to be an outer court Christian or, or holy of holy Christian? Do you want to be like the sons of Zadok who went into the holy of holies and were permitted to minister to him? Or do you want to be in the outer court who is only allowed to serve and not come close? You make that choice in how you live today. So you can have this now. A holy of holies relationship with him. Amen. It's not over. Uh, Revelation chapter, I think y'all said a hearty amen because you thought it was over, but uh, almost over. Yeah, your amens get really loud when you think it's done. Um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is building off what we just looked at. The Lord told the lukewarm Laodicean church, which would describe the church in America, describe the church in the Western world, 
Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's not, this is not an altar call for salvation. The evangelical church has used this as an altar call for salvation. It's not. Now, if people get saved by that, I'm all for it. But I'm saying the Lord's original intention was not speaking to unbelievers. He was speaking to the church. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to you. He's speaking, and he says, I'm standing outside the door, and I'm knocking. If you hear that knock, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him and he with me. Now, I want you to think about it. In terms of that diagram we've seen, your spirit here and your heart here, the Lord is here in your spirit knocking, wanting to come into your heart and your soul here and fill and permeate. But if we're so busy and we're so absorbed with what we want, then that knock will go unnoticed. But when we say, Lord... And we say, okay, Lord, you dwell here. You're knocking here. I want to come into your heart. I want to come into, like Song of Solomon 4 talks about, the bride said, come into my garden. I, I, well, we say, Lord, come into my heart. Dwell fully in my heart by faith. The Lord, when the Lord says, when the Lord comes up from your spirit and dwells in your heart, you then begin to partake of a communing, dining, relational experience with him. Conversational intimacy. We were talking about this on our Zoom call yesterday, and uh, Jacqueline made a great point. She says, you know, sometimes, is it okay if I share that? Sometimes, you know, I, I just, you know, and I think she, the reason I'm sharing this, because I think we all probably struggle with this some, is we, we're, we're, we're certain we're real with other people, and we're real with, you know, our fan, friends and family, and then when we get with God, we all of a sudden tense up and we're like, oh God, you know, dear Heavenly Father. And we get all religious. And she was saying, I just want to be real with God. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying here. Because when you dine with someone, it's, you're letting down your guard. You're, you're being real. They're being real with you. You're being real with them. And, and the best conversations you have, I've ever had, have probably been over dinner or lunch. Isn't that true? I mean, isn't that, I mean, some of the best conversations you've ever had is dining with someone over a meal. And that's what the Lord's inviting you into. A real, non-religious, I'm not saying you lose the fear of God and you become irreverent, I don't mean that, but a real dining, communing relationship of conversational intimacy where you're being real with God, he's speaking to you. You're pouring out your heart to him. He's pouring, he's pouring out his heart to you. The fellowship, God wants to share with you what's on his heart. He really does. And you don't have to go up to heaven to hear it. He's here. And if you learn how to recognize, and we're, we'll, we'll have a whole session on this, how the primary way he speaks to you, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, your times with the Lord are going to become incredible. They're going to become the, fa your, the favorite thing about your entire life. You're going to look forward to getting up in the morning and, and spending time with the Lord. It's not going to be boring and mechanical. It's not going to be dry and dead. It doesn't have to be. You're going to find your joy in the Lord. And man, do we need that right now? The world has gone mad. The world has gone crazy. If you're looking for joy in the world, you know, you're not going to find it because everything's going crazy. We've got to find the source of our joy in the Lord. And I'm telling you, you have that available to you. You just have to learn how to do it. And the Lord will teach you. The Lord will show you. But you can dine with him. You can commune with him. You can know the deepest mysteries of God's heart. You can know what the Lord is about to do. You can know the secrets. You can know his passions. You can know his burdens. You can know all of that because he dwells in you, and he wants to share that with you in a, in a relationship with you.
See, this holy of holies relationship is real. What I'm talking about is real. I've, I've experienced it, and I experience it regularly. I need to experience it more. What I'm saying is real. This is real. If you open the door of your heart to Jesus, he will come into your heart, and he will come into your heart every single time without fail. He will. If you believe, he will dwell fully and richly in your heart. And if you open the door of your heart to him, he will open the door to heaven to you. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Come up here. That you can partake of that spiritually because we have access by one spirit to the Father, access by one spirit to the Son in heaven. The Lord says... You can come up here. I'm not talking about a translation here. I'm talking about a spiritual connection, if that makes sense. I'm talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 2, knowing the deep things of God, transmitted spiritually because of that spiritual union you have with him. If you will open the door of your heart to Jesus, he will open the door of his heart to you. And he will bring you in to this revelation that you've never known or never experienced before. How incredible is that? Just incredible. Your spirit connected to the spirit of, the, of Christ has the capacity, and I'm, I'm, not saying you li, I'm not saying you literally translate to heaven, but so to speak, as it were, come up here to know what's on the heart of God. I'm talking about spiritually. This is something to, to really learn how to do, to practice it. And if you don't know, ask the Lord to show you. Ask me. I'll be glad to share with you. But, you know, I'm, I'm tapping into this barely. But this is awesome. This is the dining experience Jesus promised to his church. You can have this every single day. Now, I'm not saying... You can flip a switch and make God speak to you, okay? I'm not saying you can, you can command God to speak to you. You know, there, there's, there's days when the Lord's just silent, okay? It's just, this is nature. There's seasons when the Lord is silent, okay? I'm not trying to make it out like every single day you're having this ongoing conversation. Now, I do believe that that's, we can move more and more into that, but I, there are times when God's silent, and that's fine. God wants us not to just... Just because God's silent doesn't mean he's distant. It just means he wants you to relax and rest in him. But if you, that, that's why Jesus was saying to those who were so self-satisfied, the Laodiceans who were so lukewarm, their hunger had died, their thirst had died, and the Lord's like, I'm telling you, if you overcome lukewarmness and self-satisfaction, you can experience the greatest satisfaction of dining with me. I'm not sure there's better promises that the Lord made to the church of Laodicea than to sit on my throne and to dine with him. Because he confronted the lukewarmness and the apathy and the indifference that was in this church, that's in the American church as well. This lukewarm apathy, this indifference that I'm okay of being in the outer court. I'm okay even with the Holy of Holies. There's a little touch of God's fine with me that carries me from one week to the next. But the Lord's like, if you're hungry and if you're thirsty, you can have this Holy of Holies relationship with me here. Turn inward and come and meet with me here. Don't go out there as first looking for me. Turn here into your spirit and commune with me in the Holy of Holies and we will dine together and fellowship together and I will give you the hidden manna in the Holy of Holies that comes out of a Holy of Holies relationship with the Lord. See, because he dwells in us, we are connected to him and we can abide in him. And because he dwells in us, we don't have to go there somewhere trying to find him. We go right here into the holy of holies of your spirit to dine and to commune with him. Amen. Amen. Father, we just pray. Lord, I pray that we would, Lord, 
we would move into this. Lord, it almost sounds, it almost sounds so unbelievable that people are like, is this really the Bible? <laughs> Please go test it out. Please do. Lord, I do not want us to live in spiritual poverty when we are millionaires, billionaires, but Lord, we live on a dollar a day because of ignorance and unbelief. Dead religion blinds us to the truth, but revelation reveals that treasure and unearths that treasure. Lord, would you allow the treasure of Christ that is in us, that we have the glory of God in us, we have rivers of living water in us. We have, a, we have that ability to have a holy of holies relationship with you that connects us to the Father and the Son who are in heaven by which we can know the deep things of your heart. Would you teach us, just, just for a second, um, ask the Lord to teach you. He's the best teacher. I've asked the Lord to teach me and He's, he's done that. So ask the Lord, just take a second and say, Lord, teach me how to have a holy of holies relationship with you that's marked and characterized by dining with you. Lord, would you do that? Would you teach us? Lord, would you teach us how to have communion with you? Lord, would you teach us how to have a holy of holies relationship with you? Lord, would you teach us how to invite us into, invite you into our hearts so we could uh, commune and dine with you and all that that means? Lord, including Bible study, including getting into the word, including communion with you. Father, we do pray, Lord, that you would just bring us into the fullness of this, Lord. The fullness that we can have in this life. I pray, bring us into that. I ask you for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.